Hi, I'm Mike Bloom. This is Lesson 7, Trees of Life versus the Knowledge of Good and Evil. And we're going to go into another form, another thought about this entire issue. And I'm going to discuss the issue of the fruit of life and shed blood. And for my text, I'm going to read from Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 9. And I'm going to compare Adam's words received from God and Noah's words received from God. There are many parallels between Adam and Noah. In Noah's day, the flood had just occurred and wiped out all life on earth except for that which was taken into the ark. And so Noah was sort of like another Adam, a new beginning. But um, watch how the words given to Adam parallel the words to Noah. Genesis 1 and 28, And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it. And have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. Regarding food, verse 29 says, God said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed which is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree in the which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed. To you it shall be for meat. Chapter 2, verse 16, And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. Now, here's what he says to Noah. Very similar words. Chapter 9, verse 1, And God blessed Noah and his sons, and said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth. And the fear of you, and the dread of you, shall be upon every beast of the earth, and upon every fowl of the air, and upon all that moveth upon the earth. That was like the dominion that God had given Adam over the fish of the sea, the fowl of the air, and every living thing. Uh, and upon all the fishes of the sea, into your hand they are delivered. Regarding food, just as with Adam, we read in Genesis 9 and 3, Every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you. Now there's a difference in what Noah would eat and what Adam would eat. And we'll discuss that in a moment. But the pattern is the same. He talked about Noah's dominion and then went on to discuss the food issue. Even as the green herb have I given you all things, but flesh with the life thereof, Notice there's a stipulation, just as there was with Adam. But the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, don't eat it. But he says to Noah, but flesh with the life thereof, which is the blood thereof, shall you not eat. And surely your blood of your lives will I require. At the hand of every beast will I require it, and at the hand of man. At the hand of every man's brother will I require the life of man. Whosoever sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. For in the image of God made he man. And you, be ye fruitful, and multiply, bring forth abundantly in the earth, and multiply therein. So God's words to Adam and Noah were almost identical, but almost. Adam's words included words about fruit. Noah's words included meat. Not only did God tell Noah to be blessed and multiply and replenish the earth, as he told Adam, but he even paralleled his words to Noah concerning Adam's provision for food. While Adam could eat of any fruit, except a certain kind of fruit, Noah could eat of any meat, except a certain kind of meat. This is very significant. Adam could not eat the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. Noah could not eat meat filled with blood. So we see such a parallel between Adam and Noah, and we can get a clearer picture of the forbidden element that God desires us to avoid. By putting what was forbidden to Adam together with what was forbidden to Noah, we get a complete spiritual understanding that God wants us to understand that we might avoid what is wrong in this world. Something was forbidden to Adam that so closely resembles the thing that was forbidden to Noah. When you put both pictures together, you get a clear understanding of this. God sees something as acceptable and His will and His desire for all of us. The knowledge of good and evil, which is unacceptable, is somehow connected to meat that retains all of its blood. Genesis 2 and 9, Out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Notice that Genesis 2 and 9 says that every tree had the following qualities, pleasant to the sight 
and good for food. Obviously, it's speaking of fruit trees. All of them were pleasant to the sight and good for food. But notice the single element in the forbidden tree that was absent from all the other trees. Genesis 3 and 6, And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that's all right, pleasant to the eyes, that was in all the other trees, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, one additional element. She took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. Pleasant to the sight, good for food. That was fine. That was in all the other trees, according to Genesis 2 and 9. But to be desired to make one wise was different. The third element was the damning element. Similarly, all meats given to Noah were good. The forbidden meat had one single element that the acceptable meat did not. And uh, blood was that element that was still in the meat. And the life of the flesh was referred to as the blood. It was still in the meat. Notice that phrase, the life of the flesh. That is very spiritually significant when you think of the New Testament and how we're not to walk after the flesh, we're not to fulfill the lusts of the flesh, and so forth. The damning element was the blood in the meat, just like the desire to make one wise would damn a soul in the forbidden fruit. Now, the forbidden fruit and the forbidden meat were so similar to what was acceptable in both cases. Think of it. Remove the single additional ingredient from the forbidden, and it would have been acceptable. Remove the blood, the meat was fine. Remove the element to make self wise, and the fruit was fine. So the enemy tries to get so close to the original and the acceptable and leave one element in his offer. And that element is absolutely glaring, though, when you think about it. You see, the meat required shedding of blood before it was acceptable. This brings us perfectly to the issues that we face in the New Testament. The shedding of blood refers to the cross of Jesus Christ. Remove the shedding of blood from our religion and leave ourselves without salvation. We've got no life. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins, the Bible teaches. Hebrews 9 and 22, and almost all things are by the law purged with blood. And without shedding of blood is no remission. Removing blood means removing life of the flesh, because the blood was the life of the flesh. Galatians 5 and 16, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. But if you be led of the Spirit, you're not under the law. So you just can't train your flesh to be good. That, again, is what law was all about. Making yourself, making your flesh do good by willpower. Religions everywhere are trying that, and it's exactly the fruit, spiritually speaking, that the serpent offered to Eve. Sinful flesh that does good is still sinful flesh, and it won't be able to do the good as it should. There's only one true remedy for sinful flesh, and that is death. Not reforming the flesh, training it to be good. The flesh has to die. The great blessing is the, in the gospel is that Jesus' death on the cross counts as our deaths. And that means we've got the remedy for our sins. Here's the great litmus test for true Christianity. See if your Christianity passes this test or not. What is responsible for your life for God? Is it the way you do good and avoid evil? Or is it because Christ was sent and crucified that you might have his life? Do you think about all the things you do and the things you can't do? Is that what Christianity is to you? Or do you think about all that Christ did for you on the cross? What are you depending upon? What are you looking at? Do you consider uh, Christians to be those who do certain good deeds and avoid certain evil deeds? Is that your concept? Or do you consider good Christians to be those who look to the cross and God's deeds, God's deeds, to lead us through into victory? God bless you. Let's continue.